again, that's a not always running smoothly way, but that's a way that we want to try to say to all the ladies, uh, thank you very much. We know that Mother's Day is, is not, doesn't feel the same to everybody. And for some people, maybe it's the best day of the year. And for others, maybe it's one of the hardest days of the year. We have examples in, in Scripture of, of ladies who had lots of children. We have examples in Scripture of ladies who had no children, some of whom wanted children. And so we understand that's a really complex time. It's also a time when you're not just thinking of the ladies and whether they have kids and, or don't have kids or what their situation is, but we know it can be especially tough for moms who have lost children, and it can be especially tough for those of us who have lost mothers, some of whom in the room have lost mothers recently. And so we always, we're, at least we always want to be respectful of those things and be mindful of those things and know that, again, sometimes a day is a time to rejoice and a time to weep both. And so we want to, I'm going to pause here and give God thanks for all the good he's done for us. I want to give God thanks, especially for those ladies among this congregation who are more than simply our sisters in Christ, but for those ladies who go the extra mile to serve, to lead, to nourish, to guide, to teach in ways that sometimes many of us don't even see, but in ways that help to raise us up as you ladies in many, many ways become our our sisters and our mothers and our grandmothers in the faith. So let's give God thanks. Oh Lord God, we indeed do thank you. You who are a father who looks down in heaven. Dear Lord, I hope that the time we've just spent has been good time in your sight. Believe that it is. That what we've just done indeed does glorify you, does praise your name and gives thanks to the ladies who you brought into the lives of this church and into our personal lives as well. We thank you for them, for the work they do, for the sacrifices they make, for the wisdom that they bring, and for the ways that they help us to see you and your righteousness more clearly. Please, dear God, bless these mothers with strength, with wisdom, with patience for their children, love that we all from those who bring us into the world. And Lord, for those who, while it doesn't say everything Jesus has to say about this topic, it does present us with a summary of God's intent and God's desire for those who have entered into a covenant relationship with a husband or a wife. So let's begin by listening to what Jesus has to say according to the testimony of of Mark. Mark chapter 10, let's read verses 1 through 12. And I will have these texts on the screen for you as well. And he, the he here is Jesus. And Jesus left there and went to the region of Judea and beyond the Jordan, and crowds gathered to him again. And again, as was his custom, he taught them. And Pharisees came up, and in order to test him, asked, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? And he answered them, What did Moses command you? They said, Moses allowed a man to write a certificate of divorce and to send her away. And Jesus said to them, Because of the hardness of heart, or because of your hardness of heart, he wrote you this commandment. But from the beginning of creation... God made them male and female. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. And in the house, the disciples said to him, or asked him again about this matter, and he said to them, Whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. So this is a tough teaching. Not so much because the words Jesus say need a lot of extra definement. It's not because... 
we are, it's not as if he teaches it here in a parable and we have to wrestle with the imagery and think, well, what exactly is he getting at? It's a tough teaching because Jesus seems to respond to it very directly. And yet, there are lots of folks who struggle with thinking, how is this possible? There are a lot of people who hear what Jesus says and think, well, now, what did you just say exactly? Because if you're saying what it sounds like you're saying, how could we live up to that standard? For starters, I think it's helpful if we keep a few things in mind. Number one, as we try to hear what Jesus is saying, we have to do it with a tender heart. We have to do it with a mind open to receiving the teaching of God and understand that Jesus never gives us something that's for just to make life hard, but that everything Jesus gives us is intended to be redemptive. It's intended to be for our good. It's intended to help us be drawn closer to the Father and do a better job in our own lives of reflecting all of those good attributes and characteristics of God. His love, His wisdom, His mercy, His forgiveness, His ability to rebuild things that have been torn down, to patch things back together that have been ripped apart. God is a miracle worker when it comes to that, th that stuff. Amen? And so when Jesus gives us a command this hard, we have to stop and consider, well, why? And what are we supposed to do with it? Because I've found it to be the case in my life that sometimes whenever I come across hard teachings of Jesus, they're so difficult, especially if there's some way I haven't lived up to it, or people I care about maybe haven't lived up to it, that I, I want to deflect it a little bit. And so one easy way we tend to deflect is instead of applying it to ourselves, what do we want to do? We want to, we want to find somebody else and let Jesus speak this hard word to them instead of internalizing it first. So that's the number one thing of these three guardrails that I hope will keep us on the right track here. To know that this text is about you. So when I read the text, this text is about me. You understand what we're doing? This text is not about your neighbor. This text is not about your mom or your dad. This text is not about your children. This text is about you. And if you enter into this text with anyone else in mind, you're doing yourself and you're doing the teaching of God a disservice. Does everybody hear that? That's critical. Number two, what Jesus has to say is incredibly difficult. Again, not so much to understand the words, but to think through the application and to think through the, the what ifs because we have hundreds of them. But Jesus, what about this, or what about that, or what about this scenario? Are you saying that even in this? Because here Jesus doesn't, he doesn't go into a lot of detail. He just says, here is the original intent of God. Here is the will of God. Here is the desire of God. Here, this is what the holy standard of God looks like. This is also part of the reason we're coming back next week and looking at some additional passages. Because Mark here doesn't record everything Jesus says about this topic. And so there's more still to understand. Number three, one of the things we learn as we, as we process, not, how, not only how deeply desirous God is that marriages stay together, but whenever we begin to, to pull back the pages of Scripture and look more deeply into how marriage and the issue of, of divorce and the potential for coming back together in remarriage how all of these things function in the history of God with His people, then we run into things like the Scripture reading Grant read earlier from Hosea, where God Himself, in an illustration, says to Israel, it's like I'm your husband, and you're my wife, who I loved and who I chose and who I brought near me, but you, but you have run off, and you have prostituted yourselves with, with other nations and other so-called gods. And so there in that, in that prophecy, that great book of Hosea, God interacts with the people 
and he teaches them incredibly valuable lessons about his high standard, but also about his grace and his forgiveness and his desire to reconcile and to bring back and to put things back together that people thought were impossible to do. So again, there's a lot more to hear about this text. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 7, in the Sermon on the Mount, an important thing that relates to this first guardrail on the screen, where he says, Judge not that you be not judged, for with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when there is a log in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. We know that passage. Jesus isn't saying that we should never help a brother or sister recognize sin and help them to find repentance. But he is saying, that the first place to check for sin is in ourselves. And I think, again, that's especially true when we come across hard teachings like this one in Mark chapter 10. It would be cowardly and foolish of us to do otherwise. Sometimes people in our culture have, and this applies to our church as well, I mean, those of us who live as members of the church also live as members of the culture. Amen? I mean, we live in the world. We aren't separated from it. We're not living an isolated, monastic style of life because Jesus, we don't think, wants us to. He wants us to engage. He wants us to be relevant. He wants us to be helpful. You can go to school and become a nurse or a doctor, and you can be the best there ever was. But if you only live around healthy people, what good are you? And so God calls us to be healthy and He calls us to be holy, but He calls us to then practice that skill and practice our faith around others. And some people don't want it, but some people are hungry for it. Amen? Some people are looking for it. Amen? We aren't the only ones who live in this place, who look around the world and say, man, there's, there's so much that's wrong with it. There's got to be something better. Amen? And one of the places that we most intimately show what God looks like is where we ourselves are most intimate in our homes, in our families, in our relationships, in our marriages. And that's why in part I have number three up here to remind us that while God intends for marriage to be a great blessing, that marriage is intended to be a way that God demonstrates covenant faithfulness to us. Marriage becomes an illustration that God uses to point us to Him and the way He commits to us forever and ever and ever. But marriage is also a sacrifice. Amen? How many of you are married or have ever been married? All right, hands down. How many of you think you would like someday to be married? Okay. Well, see, there's something here for most all of us. Because marriage requires sacrifice. It's part of what makes it so difficult just part of it. There's a lot of things that make it difficult. But don't you think God knows that? And yet His standard He gives through the teaching of Jesus is way up here. Let's work through our text a bit this morning, looking at a couple of details in it as we go. And hopefully this is going to help prepare us not only for what we're reading today, but lay some foundation for what we're going to come back and look at with some additional help next week. Mark chapter 10, again, we're going to work through it a bit more slowly, starting in verse 1. And Jesus left there and he went to the region of Judea and beyond the Jordan. And crowds gathered to him again. And again, as was his custom, he taught them. And Pharisees came up and in order to test him, asked, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? 
some context may help us here. When Mark takes the time to tell us where Jesus went, that's just not so we can follow his journey on a map. I think there's also some, some clues here that help us understand some background. Jesus here is back in the same area that we read about in the opening chapters of Mark when he told us about one who came ahead of Jesus to prepare the way of the Lord. And he went out to this region and was baptizing in the Jordan River, calling people to repent. Do you remember who that man was? Who was he? John the Baptizer. Sometimes we call him John the Baptist. Mark also tells us a story about how John went and spoke to the king, Herod, and to the king's wife, Herodias. And he spoke a hard word to them, in part because Herodias, the wife of Herod, should not have been the wife of Herod, because she had been the wife of Philip, who was the brother of Herod. Anybody ever watch a soap opera? Sounds like one. And so Herod and Herodias decided they just couldn't live without each other. And so Herod took her from his brother. Now, John knows that the law of Moses frowns on such things. <laughs> but so does Herod, if he's a decent Jew, which is questionable. And so whenever John appears before Herod and Herodias, he, like a prophet, rebukes them. He scolds them. And in essence, they don't take well to that. They're humiliated by that. How dare he speak to us like that? And Mark goes on to tell the story about how there's a day when Herod was giving a great party, and his stepdaughter, the wife of Herodias and Philip, presumably, shows up and she dances in front of Herod and his drunk guests. And he's so uh, pleased with that erotic dance that he says, I'll give you anything up to half of my kingdom. Just tell me what you want. And she ran back to her mother, to Herodias, and said, here's the offer. I don't know what to ask for. Ah, uh, but Herodias did. You remember what she asked for? She said, you go right back in there and you tell Herod to give you the head of John the Baptist on a platter. And he did. So the Pharisees know that story. And so now when they have an opportunity to trap Jesus when he's back down in this very same region calling people to repentance much like John had. I think the heresies, or the heresies, maybe that's a good word for them. I think the Pharisees are wily enough in their abilities here that they think, hmm, we've been after this guy for a long time. And you might say, how do you know they've been after them? Well, in Mark chapter 3, verse 6, it says the Pharisees went out and immediately held counsel with the Herodians against Jesus how to destroy Jesus. They've been after him for a while. And so now he's back down in this region where anything he says and does is going to be well known to Herod and his family. And the Pharisees are like, how can we get Herod to do our dirty work for us? Ah, remember what happened when John talked about adultery? Let's ask Jesus a question that hinges on the idea of adultery. Verse 3. Jesus answered them, as He often does, with a question of His own. They said, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? And Jesus said, why did Moses command you? Now, why, why is this important? Well, it's because the Pharisees live by the law of God, the Torah, the law of Moses that God gave Moses at Sinai. Sometimes this is called the Mosaic Covenant. Sometimes this is called, uh, well, we won't go down all that rabbit hole. <laughs> Just stick with where I am. Time is short as it is. And Jesus says, well, why did Moses command you? And they said, well, Moses allowed a man to write a certificate of divorce and to send his wife away. Well, is that true? It is. 
So what passage are they talking about? What are they referring to? Well, they're referring to Deuteronomy chapter 24. This is not going to appear on the screen, but I'll read it to you. Deuteronomy chapter 24, verses 1 through 4. It says, When a man takes a wife and marries her, if then she finds no favor in his eyes, because he has found some indecency in her, and he writes her a certificate of divorce, and he puts it in her hand, and he sends her out of his house, and she departs his house, if she goes and becomes another man's wife, and that latter man hates her and writes her a certificate of divorce and puts it in her hand and sends her out of his house, or if the latter man dies who took her to be his wife, and then her former husband who sent her away, he may not take her again to be his wife after she has been defiled, for that is an abomination before the Lord. And you shall not bring sin upon the land that the Lord your God has given you for an inheritance. And you might be thinking, whoa, wait, what's, all, what's going on exactly with that? Well, we're not going to get all into the details of that this morning. But part of what that law is intended to do is to protect women from being treated like chattel, like property. Because a woman would bring a dowry. She would bring money or some, some sort of inheritance from her father's household into her marriage that her husband would receive. And so part of what the law here is saying is, look, look, dude. If you marry this girl and she comes into your family and she brings you this dowry, you, you can't on some nonsensical whim decide that, well, you've got her stuff now because you get to keep it in this divorce. You can't decide what she's, pro she's provided all the value she's going to bring you and you're not all that happy with her anymore. Or someone down the street's a little younger or a little cuter or a little more entertaining. So you cannot just divorce her with the anticipation that, well, maybe, you'll, maybe she'll come back around later when she has a dowry again. And so part of what God is doing through Moses in Deuteronomy 24 is protecting women from that kind of treatment. But that's not all that he's doing, but that's part of it. And so these Old Testament instructions about divorce are what the Pharisees and Jesus are talking about. And the Pharisees and other theologians of their day debated what Moses means when he writes, if he finds some indecency in her. Some believed, some of the Pharisees believed, that you could only divorce for reasons of sexual immorality, of sexual sin. And this is involving more than just adultery, because in the Pharisees' mind, the way the law read, if you found your wife to commit adultery, the answer wasn't divorce. The answer was stoning. The answer was execution, according to the law. But there are some other Pharisees who read that if you find some indecency in her to mean, hey, if she disturbs you or disappoints you in any way. And someone says, like, what? She snores too loud? Sure. She burns your breakfast? Yep. You just get tired of her. Sure, why not? And it seems the Pharisees in some ways may, may not only be looking for Jesus to hang himself with Herod, but they're asking him to choose a side maybe in this debate. And Jesus responds, knowing what the debate's about, and said, because of your hardness of heart, Moses wrote you this commandment. But see, now Jesus doesn't dig in to the details of, of their little uh, sidebar debates. Instead, he gets right to the matter, and he brings it back to where the judge is sitting, to God. And he says, but you know, this was not God's will from the beginning. And then Jesus quotes from two places in Genesis. So what you have here on the screen where he says, God made them male and female, he's quoting Moses in Genesis. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. And now he quotes again from Genesis, here in verse 7. and says, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh, so that they are no longer two, but one flesh. And so Jesus summarizes it and says, So therefore, what God has joined together, let no man separate. But that's hard, is it not? 
Because if all we hear is, is this passage in Mark, it sounds like, it sounds like what Jesus is saying is God doesn't allow divorce. And you know how we know that's how it sounded to them? Because when the disciples heard it, they were so shocked that when they had some private time with Jesus, they asked him again. Verse 10. And so in the house, this means later, after they've left the, the, the public space, the disciples asked Jesus again about this matter. And he said to them, whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against his wife. That's, that's the her. That's the reference here. And if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. Well, adultery, it was agreed upon by everybody and any party of the Pharisees that adultery was against the law of God. It's part of the Ten Commandments, is it not? And so when Jesus says divorce leads in almost every case to adultery, the disciples say, what? In fact, I'll, I'll, I'll do a little spoiler alert here for next year, for next year, for next week. Whenever we read in Matthew 19 next week, as Matthew records the same incident, just in greater detail, the disciples, when they hear Jesus' words, you know what they're going to say? They're going to say, if this is the case, then it's better for a man not to get married at all. If he has no way out, if he has no option, if he's locked in, then it'd be better if he just didn't get married. That's what they're going to say. And Jesus says, well, to summarize, not everyone can handle this. But some people are called to be single before God, to be celibate before God. You're like, whoa, hold on now. <laughs> that adds a whole other dimension to this. It does. And we'll get into some of that again next week. It is a difficult, difficult topic because it's addressing something that is such a prevalent reality in our world. It's not only people out there who struggle with marriage. It's also people in here. It's not only people out there who find themselves in divorce or after divorce or contemplating divorce. It's also people in here. This is why we gave those three guardrails at the beginning. Do you remember any of them? Remember the very first one? It's the most important. That this text is about who? You. The text is about you. Because it's all too common for instead people to think about somebody else. Think, oh, well, what's this person going to do? Oh, well, now I know what this person should do. Again, have we talked about everything Jesus has to say about this yet? We have not. Are we qualified to make a judgment and a decision about all the thorny situations people get themselves into in their relationships? Do you feel qualified to do that? I don't think you are yet. If you're basing it on what you've heard today, you're not. So if anybody pretends that this is the time you put on a black robe, you grab a gavel, and you walk up to pronounce judgment on one of God's children, I would caution you. Say again, this text is about you. Jesus' words here in verses 10 through 12 are pretty straightforward. But the application of them seems so hard that the disciples continue to wonder how it's possible to live up to the standard of God. This is tough stuff, especially if you've already lived through divorce. I have never been divorced. Charity and I will be married 24 years on the 23rd of this month. But I've lived through divorce twice when I was a kid. So my parents were divorced when I was about seven. 
A couple years later, my mom remarried another man in the church, another believer. And 10 years later, he had an affair and ran off. And so my mom went through divorce again. I should say we went through divorce because everybody in the house goes through the divorce. It impacts, it impacts everybody, whether you got a vote in it or not. So whenever we talk about topics like this, they're not theoretical to me. They're very real, and they become very real to you when you've gone through it or or, or if you're contemplating it or if someone you love has dealt with it. And it's times like that when we realize that we all rely on the unending grace of God because we don't have all the answers. And none of us are perfect. No, not one. And this, this difficulty, this challenge, this brokenness, this pain that accompanies divorce and the breakdown of relationship is a a shining example of what sin does. It entangles. It enslaves It weighs us down and it breaks us in every way we let it so that our hope and strength is found only in the redemptive grace of God. Amen? So again, don't leave here today thinking you've heard all that Jesus has to say about divorce and remarriage. You have heard Jesus proclaim the ideal desire of God who is holy and righteous that what he has joined together, let no man separate. That is God's desire. That is our aim. That is our goal. That is what we push for. But we're going to hear Jesus and the Apostle Paul next week speak to the reality that there are some things in life that we, we, we simply cannot handle. And so he's going to talk about what we sometimes refer to as exceptions to this standard. So please don't leave today thinking you've heard all that Jesus has to say about this topic. We'll take up the rest next week, Lord willing. So I hope that you'll come back. I hope you'll be prayerful during the week that you will have ears to hear and a tender heart to receive the word of the Lord. I also ask that you'll pray for me if that's not already part of what you do in the week. I hope it is but that you'll pray for me that I might only speak what honors God and that I'll only speak it in a way that is as gracious as He is. Before we conclude our service this morning, let's pray. Our dear God in heaven, You are our Father. You are our God. You are one who has called us into a covenant with You that we entered into by vow in our baptism, pledging our life to you and to none other, pledging to love, honor, and obey you until until death comes. And so, Lord, we ask for the strength to do that, both in our relationship with you and in the relationships we've entered into in this life that are supposed to model the faithfulness and the devotion that comes when a husband and a wife say, I do. Lord, we also, we beg you, God, for the strength, for the wisdom, for the graciousness to be able to find our way through with your great help, with the leading of your spirit, through all the entanglements that we find ourselves in in this life because of the way Satan and sin break us down and wedge their way into every crack and every relationship we have hoping to separate and divide us, hoping to rip apart what you have woven together. And so, Lord, we do indeed ask you both for your forgiveness and for your grace, for your wisdom to move forward, for the strength and encouragement that come from you and that should be exhibited by this family of faith so that rather than be judges of one another, we're brothers and sisters who bring honor to your name in love. Lord, we pray all this in the name of the one who died and was raised for us, Jesus Christ, your Son. Amen.
If you have any need this morning at all that we can help study with you for, that we can pray with you for, or that we can baptize you into Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, if you have any need at all, we ask you to come as we stand now and sing.